Good afternoon. I am Marlene Johnson Moore, Equal Opportunity Specialist with the Programs and Compliance Branch of the HUD Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, FHEO. I am very pleased to join you today during this, the 53rd anniversary of Fair Housing Month to discuss HUD Fair Housing case studies. If you have questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box and I will be happy to answer your questions from the chat and in the roundtable discussion immediately following this workshop. During this workshop, I will briefly review both the HUD FHEO mission statement and the Fair Housing Act, and I will discuss three fair housing discrimination case studies, including a sexual harassment case, a reasonable accommodation case, and an assistance animal case. And I will discuss President Biden's executive order on preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. The HUD FHEO mission is to eliminate housing discrimination, promote economic opportunity, and achieve diverse, inclusive communities. This, of course, is a national effort, and it is achieved through multiple and layered actions such as enforcement and public understanding of federal fair housing policies and laws which is accomplished through community education and outreach. FHEO Region 4 is made up of two main divisions, enforcement, which conducts intake investigations and fair housing discrimination cases, and programs and compliance, which oversees compliance of fair housing and civil rights laws for agencies that receive federal funding assistance in an eight state region of the Southeast, which includes South Carolina. The primary law that the Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity Office employs to implement its policies is Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act of 1968, the Fair Housing Act. Fundamentally, the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in housing because of a person's race, color, religion, national origin, sex, familial status, or disability. Although the Fair Housing Act drives much of the enforcement work under FHEO, there are several other laws that are enforced by FHEO, including Section 109 of Title I of the Housing and Community Development Act of 1974, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and also the ADA, Architectural Barriers Act, Age Discrimination, Title IX Education, and also Executive Orders. HUD recently began implementing President Biden's Executive Order 13988 on preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. And I will discuss that in further detail later in the workshop. The Fair Housing Act is primarily enforced through fair housing discrimination investigations. These investigations are typically generated by complainants who perceive they have been harmed by their housing provider based on a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Violations include, but are not limited to, refusal to rent or sell, setting different terms, privileges, and or conditions for the sale or rental of a dwelling, imposing different sales prices or rental charges, using different qualification criteria, failing to perform or delaying maintenance and repairs, and harassment. The investigations are initiated by filing a complaint, which our regional complaints office examines to determine if HUD has jurisdiction to investigate the matter. If the complaint is jurisdictional, HUD conducts a thorough investigation into the facts and circumstances of the complaint. Once the investigation is complete, the complaint is determined to be either no cause, meaning there was not enough evidence to substantiate a violation of the Fair Housing Act, or cause, meaning the greater weight of the evidence found that the Fair Housing Act was violated based on the housing provider's actions or inactions. These cases may also be resolved through an alternative dispute resolution process called mediation. Now that I have given you a brief background of FHEO's national mission and foundational civil rights laws, I will begin my discussion on the HUD Fair Housing Discrimination Case Studies. First, we begin with a sexual harassment case study. The case I'm going to discuss today is a case in which HUD issued findings against three respondents in North Carolina. The respondents subjected female applicants and participants in the Section 8 voucher program 
to discrimination on the basis of sex, including severe, pervasive, and unwelcome sexual harassment on multiple occasions in violation of Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act. The case was charged by HUD and decided by the United States District Court of Middle North Carolina to enforce the Fair Housing Act against the respondents. Before I get into the details of the case, I will advise that under the Fair Housing Act, sexual harassment generally falls under two theories, quid pro quo or hostile environment. Quid pro quo is a Latin phrase meaning this for that and occurs when a sexual favor is sought in exchange for a housing benefit. A hostile environment is present when sexually offensive behavior unreasonably interferes with a person's use or enjoyment of a dwelling. In addition to the general sections of the Fair Housing Act, such as failure to rent or sell or denial of maintenance or services, sexual harassment may also result in coercion, intimidation, threats, or interference with a person's exercise and enjoyment of their fair housing rights or criminal or physical intimidation. Sexual harassment presents in many forms within housing. This North Carolina case was initiated through a HUD complaint, which was eventually charged and brought within the United States District Court in North Carolina to enforce the Fair Housing Act against the respondents. The respondents were two individuals and a corporation. The charge and the initial allegations were based on respondents' actions, which subjected female applicants and participants in the Section 8 voucher program to discrimination on the basis of sex, including severe, pervasive, and unwelcome sexual harassment on multiple occasions in violation of the Fair Housing Act. The conduct alleged included making unwelcome sexual comments and unwelcome sexual advances to female applicants and participants in the Section 8 voucher program, including subjecting them to unwanted sexual touching, conditioning or offering tangible housing benefits such as advancing female applicants on the Section 8 waiting list and increasing female participants' Section 8 benefits in exchange for sexual acts and taking adverse housing actions or threatening to take, to take such actions against female applicants and participants in the Section 8 voucher program who had not granted or would not continue to grant sexual favors. Based on the two theories I described in the previous slide, please type in the chat whether you think this would fall under Title VIII quid pro quo or hostile environment. The district court case was filed against the two respondents for their discriminatory conduct that occurred while they were exercising their authority as employees of the corporation. The corporation was held liable because it hired the two employees and knew or should have known of their employees' discriminatory conduct. The corporation had the authority to take preventative and corrective action, and it failed to take reasonable or preventative or corrective measures. This case is an example that a property management company, a public housing authority, or other types of employers can be held liable for the actions of their employees. The respondents denied all the allegations against them and the court decree stated that it should not be construed as an admission that the respondents engaged in unlawful or discriminatory acts or conduct. Nevertheless, the court issued a decree with multiple provisions, remedies and corrective actions, including but not limited to enjoining the respondent employees from directly or indirectly participating in any Section 8 voucher program responsibilities, either through housing benefits provided by the subject corporation or another provider of such housing benefits. Enjoining the respondent employees from directly or indirectly participating in any property management responsibilities at any residential rental property. Requiring the respondent corporation to employ an independent manager to operate its Section 8 voucher program. Requiring the respondent corporation to create a written non-discrimination policy, including a policy prohibiting sexual harassment of its clients and a formal grievance procedure. 
requiring the respondent corporation, including all of its officers, agents, employees, successors, and assigns to undergo in-person training on non-discrimination laws, including the Fair Housing Act, with specific emphasis on discrimination on the basis of sex and sexual harassment, and requiring the respondent corporation to transfer into a dedicated account the total sum of $1,700,000 as compensation for aggrieved persons who had been harmed by the conduct alleged. The respondents were also personally liable to pay an additional $27,000 as a civil penalty in the form of monetary damages to persons aggrieved based on a pattern of practice of resistance to the full enjoyment of the complainant's fair housing rights. This is known as the Lorenberg Settlement. At the time, it was the largest settlement of its kind in federal housing history. This is a photograph of Christian Sellers, one of the named complainants who came forward with allegations against the respondents. You see here, Christian says, I was trying to fix my life and this put a halt on it. And with that, I will conclude this section on sexual harassment cases. If you have questions related in general to sexual harassment or to this specific case, please type them into the chat or reserve them for the roundtable discussion following the workshop. The case I'm going to discuss today under reasonable accommodation is a recent case in which HUD issued findings against the Housing Authority of Dallas, Texas, or DHA. DHA discriminated against a tenant with a disability by failing to provide a reasonable accommodation and seeking to evict her. The letter of findings was based on Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, or Section 504, and Title II of the Americans with Disability Act, or the ADA. After sustaining substantial physical injuries due to a major car accident, including a broken hip, broken femur, broken pelvis, and a broken arm, and enduring roughly a month of rehabilitation, the complainant was discharged from the hospital. As a result of the accident, complainant primarily used a wheelchair from March 2019 through October 2019 although she occasionally used a walker or cane as she sought to relearn the ability to walk. Since she was unable to walk, let alone traverse stairs, complainant submitted a written request for a reasonable accommodation to be transferred from her second floor unit to a first floor unit. Complainant's doctor submitted verification explaining that due to complainant's mobility impairment, she needed a reasonable accommodation transfer to a ground floor unit. The DHA granted complainant's request. Complainant re reported that following DHA's approval of the accommodation and after learning that her request had been granted, she checked in on the status of her request with the property manager multiple times. But despite the obvious and urgent need to transfer a complainant to a first floor unit, the DHA never implemented complainant's reasonable accommodation. Because of this failure to implement complainant's reasonable accommodation from April 8, 2019 until October 16, 2019, complainant was forced to crawl up to her second floor unit on her hands and knees. Complainant estimates that it would take approximately 45 minutes to go up and down these stairs after her accident. Not only did this greatly limit her independence, forcing her to rely on assistance just to leave her unit, but it also frequently put complainant in dangerous situations, including a fall that left her with substantial chest injuries that required hospitalization. Section 504 and Title II of the ADA require public housing authorities, such as the DHA, to make reasonable accommodations to policies, practices, and programs to ensure equal opportunities for individuals with disabilities to participate in 
and benefit from programs and activities. HUD concludes that a complainant is a person with a disability within the meaning of 504 in the ADA because they have a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities or major bodily functions. HUD found that the DHA violated Section 504 in the ADA by failing to effectuate complainant's reasonable accommodation requests, which denied complainant equal opportunity to benefit from the DHA's housing because of complainant's disability. Furthermore, HUD found that the DHA unlawfully interfered with complainant in the exercise of her rights based on its pursuit of an unlawful eviction against complainant immediately following her request for a reasonable accommodation. Due to the DHA's failure to comply with its civil rights obligations, complainant suffered substantial harm, including in the form of physical pain, humiliation, and mental anguish. HUD will require, based on its findings, that the DHA enter into a voluntary compliance agreement, or VCA, to resolve the findings and allow the Public Housing Authority to undertake corrective actions. Some of the remedies may include making complainant whole through compensatory damages, which may include monetary relief for the complainant based on moving expenses she had to incur, temporary housing costs, furniture storage, medical expenses, or lost rent or lost housing opportunities. In addition, the complainant may receive compensatory damages for emotional distress based on any symptoms she suffered as a result of housing discrimination. Although the VCA has not been drafted, in VCAs for similar circumstances, HUD has required that the Housing Authority process reasonable accommodation requests in accordance with the law HUD required that the Housing Authority review its existing reasonable accommodation policy to ensure that the PHA acknowledged that it would provide reasonable accommodations and modification, modifications at its expense and provide prompt responses to requests for reasonable accommodations in its rules and policies. In VCAs for similar cases, HUD required that the PHA advise residents of their rights to request a reasonable accommodation including accessible features, and that it include in its policy different types of accommodations, and that it offer the option to residents to remain in their current unit while accessibility modifications were made where the unit modifications would not pose a health and safety risk to the current residents. In prior VCAs, HUD required regular trainings on compliance with Section 504 and the ADA for PHA staff. In this case, the training will likely include the Section 504 and ADA coordinator, general counsel, and DHA's property managers. Additional remedies in this case will likely include, based on the findings, that the DHA modifies policy to empower the Section 504 and ADA coordinator to effectuate approved requests for reasonable accommodations, Amend, amendments of the provisions of DHA's lease and occupancy handbook to comply with 504 and the ADA, reformation of DHA's grievance panel procedures to ensure compliance with its responsibility to individuals with disabilities under section 504 and the ADA, as well as compliance with HUD's regulations. And that concludes this section on reasonable accommodation cases. If you have questions related in general to reasonable accommodations or this specific case, please type them in the chat or reserve them for the roundtable discussion following the workshop. Next, I'm going to discuss assistance animal case studies. The case I'm going to discuss was recently resolved in Georgia through HUD's mediation process and, result, and resulted in a compliance agreement between HUD and the respondents. The respondents engaged in discrimination based on a complainant's disability by delaying her reasonable accommodation request for an emotional support animal. Before I go into the details of the case, I want to advise that HUD issued a joint statement 
of the Department of Housing and Urban Development and the Department of Justice on reasonable accommodations under the Fair Housing Act in March 2004 and on reasonable modifications under the Fair Housing Act in March 2008. This guidance has not been amended, superseded, or rescinded. However, recently, HUD issued updated guidance that should be read together with the joint HUD DOJ statement on reasonable accommodations. The recent guidance is entitled Assessing a Person's Request to Have an Animal as a Reasonable Accommodation under the Fair Housing Act. It was published on January 28th, 2020. All of these documents are available to the public for reference. The new guidance discusses two types of assistance animals, service animals and other trained or untrained animals that do work, perform tasks, provide assistance, and or provide therapeutic emotional support for individuals with disabilities. And these are referred, in the guide, referred to in the guidance as support animals. Assistance animals are not pets under the Fair Housing Act. Persons with disabilities may request a reasonable accommodation for service animals and other types of assistance animals, including support animals under the Fair Housing Act. The new guidance also provides housing providers with a set of best practices for complying with the Fair Housing Act when assessing requests for reasonable accommodations to keep animals in housing, including the information that a housing provider may need to know from a health care provider professional, about an individual's need for an assistance animal, criteria for assessing whether to grant the requested accommodation, disability determinations, and documentation from the internet. The case that I'm going to discuss was initiated by a HUD Fair Housing complaint in which the complainant alleged that the respondent housing providers, in this case, a property manager, and a broker denied her request for an emotional support animal multiple times. Complainant had submitted documentation from her medical provider stating she had a psychological disability and needed an emotional support animal, a cat, to help alleviate her symptoms and to help her cope. The first letter the complainant submitted was sufficient to demonstrate that she had a disability and that she had a disability related need for the emotional support animal. However, complainant's property manager stated that the documentation was not adequate because it needed to have the medical provider's letterhead, date, signature, and license number on the document before her reasonable accommodation request could be granted. The property manager initially stated that the requirements were based on Georgia real estate law but could not produce the citation or evidence of the applicable law during the investigation. Complainant returned to the medical provider a second time and requested additional documentation, which our psychologist provided and which the complainant submitted to her property manager, who again refused to accept the document. Before complainant could request the third set of documents, unbeknownst to her, the property manager followed her to the doctor's office, and once there, the property manager requested the complainant's medical records in violation of the Fair Housing Act, HIPAA, and other privacy laws, and then berated the staff within the doctor's office to the point where the police had to be called. Even though respondents eventually granted the complainant's reasonable accommodation request, the multiple refusals resulted in delays that effectively constituted a denial in violation of the Fair Housing Act. The property manager's egregious act of visiting the complainant's doctor's office and demanding information was also violative of the Fair Housing Act. This case resulted in a conciliation agreement between HUD and the respondents, but would have more than likely been a charge case based on the respondents' discriminatory actions. Although the respondents denied engaging in discriminatory actions and disclaimed false liability and responsibility for complainants' alleged damages, 
they entered into a conciliation agreement to resolve the matter without the necessity of an evidentiary hearing or other judicial process available under the law. The specific provisions of the conciliation agreement included compensatory relief for a complainant in the amount of $18,500, mandatory training for the named respondents and all staff employed by the subject property performing rental management and administrative duties. The agreement required the staff to attend education courses on the Fair Housing Act in general and the course with which specifically focused on assistance animals and reasonable accommodation. The respondents were also required to certify compliance with the provisions of the agreement and implement record keeping to demonstrate compliance. And that will conclude this section on assistance animal cases. If you have questions related in general to reasonable accommodations or assistance animals or this specific case, please type them in the chat or reserve them for the roundtable discussion following the workshop. Before I close, I will briefly discuss President Biden's executive order on preventing and combating discrimination on the basis of gender identity or sexual orientation. President Biden's Executive Order 13988 directed executive agencies to conduct a thorough investigation of their internal policies and to revise, suspend, or rescind any that infringed on or targeted LGBTQ plus rights. HUD was the first federal agency to have expanded protections for LGBTQ plus Americans. Acting Assistant Secretary Janine Warden has stated that HUD under the Biden administration will fully enforce the Fair Housing Act to prohibit discrimination based on gender identity and sexual orientation. HUD's actions in this regard rely on the department's legal conclusion that the Fair Housing Act's sex discrimination provisions are comparable in text and purpose to those of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which bars sex discrimination in the workplace. In a recent landmark case, Bostock versus Clayton County, the Supreme Court held that workplace prohibitions on sexual discrimination include discrimination because of sexual orientation and gender identity. HUD has now determined that the prohibition on sex discrimination in housing within Title VIII of the Fair Housing Act, the Fair Housing Act, or, or excuse me, within Title VIII of the Civil Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act, likewise includes discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and gender, gender identity. Accordingly, and consistent with President Biden's executive order, HUD will enforce the Fair Housing Act to prevent and combat such discrimination. HUD has ordered its regional offices and grantees to review all complaints submitted since Biden's inauguration on January 20th, 2021. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. And I look forward to spending time with you in the roundtable discussion and responding to your questions.